Hello, my name is Marta Bosk, and I would like to thank you for giving us the opportunity to present our work here. We are a small group in Barcelona, led by Albert Paul, and the work I will present you today has been done in collaboration with Rob Parton. First of all, I would like to start with a brief introduction of the organelle we are interested in, the lipid droplet. Cells have developed and specialized organelles to accumulate lipids, the lipid droplet, and organisms have a specialized tissue to store them, the adipose tissue. We have adipose tissue under the skin, around the major organs of our body, even around the heart. But apart from lipids, we do not have professional tissue to accumulate other energetic substrates such as glucose or amino acids. In fact, glucose can be converted into fatty acids and stored in the adipose tissue. And that is because lipids are very special sort of molecules. They are highly hydrophobic molecules. Lipids such as phospholipids or cholesterol allow them generation of barriers that in the form of bilayers allow the formation and function of compartments of organelles within the cells. Lipids are essential components of crucial molecules such as lipoproteins or hormones. And they are also important second messengers in the form of diacylglycerol ceramides or eicosanoids, mediating inflammation. In addition, and very importantly, fatty acids are highly reduced molecules, highly energetic, that in the form of triacylglycerols have been selected during evolution as the main nutrient store of eukaryotic cells. But although having many important biological functions, they can also be highly toxic compounds. In all eukaryotic cells, when the lipid arrival is higher than the lipid consumption, to avoid lipotoxicity, fatty acid and cholesterols are sterified and stored within the lipid droplets newly formed. When the external arrival of lipids is reduced, then will be the lipid droplet who gradually supply the required lipids to generate membranes to produce metabolic energy or to synthesize lipoproteins and hormones. This process occurs basically to avoid lipotoxicity. Lipids are essential for life, but an excess of lipids can potentially be harmful by changing the fluidity of membranes or generating an excess of signaling molecules such as diacylglycerol or ceramides. This will end up affecting organelles' functionality, endoplasmic reticulum and mitochondrial dysfunction and cell damage or even cell death. This sort of lipotoxicity is behind some of the most prevalent diseases in our society, like obesity and related diseases such as type 2 diabetes, atherosclerosis and non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, and also behind diseases which are not directly related with lipids, such as cancer and neurodegeneration. So lipid droplets, here in red, are formed in all eukaryotic cells from yeast to mammals and they have this appearance by electromicroscopy. A spherical organelles surrounded by a single monolayer of phospholipids, plenty of neutral lipids inside and normally in contact with other organelles such as the mitochondria. The prevalent model suggests that lipid droplets are formed at the cytoplasmic phase of the endoplasmic reticulum. The progressive accumulation of neutral lipids between the two leaflets of the endoplasmic reticulum bilayer increases the curvature of the membrane and the nasal lipid droplet will be converted into the globular lipid droplet and a mature lipid droplet. When these cells are observed by tilting microscopy, it becomes evident how the bilayer of the endoplasmic reticulum is converted into the monolayer of the lipid droplet. This is a very fast process. In the left panel, you can see the endoplasmic reticulum with few lipid droplets already there in red. After the addition of a fluorescent fatty acid, in the right panel, you will see that it takes just few seconds to observe the formation of new lipid droplet. Here it is. The formation of new lipid droplets, however, is a very complex process. All these enzymes are synchronized to produce and transform all these lipids with the help of many different proteins to finally generate the lipid droplet. 
Once they are formed, lipid droplets participate in many crucial different functions in specialized cells. For example, in adipocytes, lipid droplets supply the energetic substrates that will be used for the rest of the body to produce energy during fasting. In hepatocytes, provide lipids for the synthesis of bile cells, lipoproteins, and ketone bodies. In muscle and cardiac cells, lipid droplets contain the energy that will allow the contraction and movement. In mammary gland, lipid droplets are secreted into milk to feed the newborn. And in seeds, lipid droplets provide the energy that will be used for a rapid regenerative. And all these functions are tightly regulated by a specific subset of proteins accumulated on the lipid droplet surface. Even that for a long time lipid droplets have been considered a sort of inert fat inclusions, today we know that lipid droplets are authentic organelles. 150 proteins have been described as bona fide lipid droplets, including perilipins, which are exclusive of this organelle. Most of the proteins are related to the synthesis and metabolism of lipids, including autophagy. But they also accumulate proteins which are not directly related to lipids, such as histones, toxic proteins, or transcription factors, suggesting that the functions of lipid droplets go beyond lipids. Very recently, the importance of the lipid droplets in bioenergetic processes is becoming more evident. Changes in nutrient availability require the adaptation from fat to fasting metabolism, what is called metabolic flexibility, and lipid droplets and mitochondria have a crucial role. When nutrients are available, the majority of cells use glucose to generate ATP, and most of the excess of energy is stored in lipid droplets of adipocytes. During fasting, when levels of circulating glucose fall, there is a switch on the bioenergetic fluxes, and lipid droplets from the adipose tissue provide the main energetic source for the rest of the organism. During fasting, the fatty acids produced by lipolysis in the adipose tissue are released into the circulation and internalized by other cells such as myocytes, hepatocytes, and cardiomyocytes, and mostly re-esterified in lipid droplets. Then, when metabolic energy is required, these lipid droplets will supply fatty acids to mitochondria to produce ATP. The rapid access of the energetic substrates in nutrient-poor conditions is facilitated by a subcellular rearrangement. Lipid droplets and mitochondria get closer and interact. In cell fractionation experiments, we found that during fasting, Lipid droplets accumulate proteins such as perilipin 5, plain 5, a protein known to be involved in connecting lipid droplets and mitochondria. Furthermore, mitochondrial proteins such as ATP synthase are also detected in the lipid droplet fraction, proving the association of both organelles in starvation conditions. In fact, we realize that nutrient conditions determine the mobility and location of lipid droplets, here in red. In the presence of glucose and fatty acids, lipid droplets are quite immobile and packed in the perinuclear region of the cell. However, when nutrients are depleted, lipid droplets become very motile and adopt a dispersed distribution within the cell. This dispersed distribution is dependent on microtubules. During starvation, Lipid droplets are recruited to a specific type of microtubules, the deteriorated microtubules. And that facilitates interaction with the mitochondria, which are also located at the same type of microtubules, increasing the number of contacts. In this video, you can observe how mitochondria, labeled in red, are chasing lipid droplets and interacting with them. We have shown that lipid droplets and mitochondria move to the same type of microtubules during starvation. This relocation facilitates the interaction between both organelles and the transfer of the fatty acids stored into lipid droplets to the mitochondria 
to obtain metabolic energy. These contacts, functionally described as metabolic synapses, have become hubs able to sense and respond to the energetic demands of the cells and have important implications, including the metabolic changes occurring during infection, as I will show you later. So, a part of their role in lipid metabolism, expanding role of lipid droplets are being described, including endoplasmic reticulum homeostasis and also as protein storage organelles. And today I would like to present to you some of our work and I will try to convince you that lipid droplets are also crucial organelles for sensing and responding to infection. This project has been done in collaboration with Steve Gross, Rob Parton and Patricia Bozza and funded by the Human Frontiers Science Program. One of the most intriguing phenotypes of infected cells is the accumulation of lipid droplets. This is delivered during an endotoxic shock, where you can see how hepatocytes accumulate lipid droplets. So, the initial question was, why do lipid droplets accumulate in infected cells? It is known that lipid droplets are part of the life cycle of many pathogens. Different viruses, like dengue virus or hepatitis C, Different bacteria like mycobacteria or chlamydia or parasites like plasmodium or trypanosoma target the lipid droplets once they are inside the infected host cell. In fact, the infection of these pathogens activates the biogenesis of lipid droplets in the host cell. The current view is that lipid droplets support the infection by providing energy and structural lipids required for the effective growth of the pathogen. If lipid droplets are part of the life cycle of many pathogens, our working hypothesis was whether the host has evolved any lipid droplet related defense mechanism as part of the immune response. There are some evidences that lipid droplets actively participate in the response against the invaders rather than just being an advantage for the pathogen. Some innate immunity related proteins localized to lipid droplets during infection, like viperin, an antiviral protein with activity against two of the viruses that employ lipid droplets during assembly, hepatitis C virus and dengue virus, and IGTP, an immunity related GTPase required for resistance to Toxoplasma gondii. The next evidence was related to histones. We have also collaborated with the laboratory of Steve Gross, where they show that lipid droplets actively participate in the Drosophila antibacterial response. They isolate lipid droplets from Drosophila embryos and mix with bacterial culture and check bacterial growth after plating. The number of bacterial colonies was much lower when lipid droplets were added to the cell culture. It was described that histones were associated to lipid droplets in Drosophila, and to check if they were involved, lipid droplets were mixed with bacteria now in the presence of antibodies against histones. The inhibitory effect of lipid droplets was now reverted. To analyze whether lipid droplet histones were able to protect embryos in response to infection, they took the advantage that in Drosophila, Java is the known receptor of histones in lipid droplets. So fly mutants that do not express Java were created, where histones were no longer associated to lipid droplets. When the survival rate of the embryos was analyzed after infection with different bacteria, it turned out that Java knockout didn't survive to infection. Therefore, histones present in lipid droplets protect embryos from bacterial infection. And the initial question of the project was whether mammalian lipid droplets have a similar antibacterial activity. To address this, we set up an experimental system and we work with liver since it's a key organ in modulating the systemic immune response and hepatocytes can be infected with those pathogens that were related with lipid droplets. We isolate lipid droplets using a sucrose density gradient and we obtained different fractions. 
we purify the lipid droplet fraction and from here we extract the lipid droplet associated proteins. Next, we tested their antibacterial capacity against gram-negative bacteria, E. coli, in a bacterial killing assay where the purified proteins were incubated with bacteria and analyzed the bacterial viability, plating them in serial dilutions and counting the number of colonies. The first thing we observed was that increasing concentrations of lipid droplet proteins reduced the number of bacterial colonies. To test whether this antibacterial activity of lipid droplets was constitutive or regulated, we simulated the bacterial infection in mice by injection of LPS, lipopolysaccharide, the main component of the outer membrane of gram-negative bacteria and a potent activator of innate immunity. We observed that LPS infection increases the amount of lipid droplets in liver, and when we perform the bacterial killing assay, we found that using the same amount of proteins, lipid droplets from LPS-treated mice had a much higher antibacterial capacity. These results were confirmed by our colleagues in Brazil. The laboratory of Patricia Bozza, they use another model of infection, sickle ligation and puncture, a clinical model that consists of the perforation of the sickle and generate an exacerbated immune response induced by polymicrobial infection. Infection also induces lipid droplets accumulation and again, purified proteins from liver lipid droplets from CLP mice have higher antibacterial capacity. We next wonder if this antibacterial activity was also happening in vivo. In collaboration with Rob Parton, we infected with the E. coli human macrophages and treated or treated with oleic acid to increase the number of lipid droplets. The results showed that growth of E. coli was significantly reduced in those cells loaded with lipid droplets, meaning that lipid droplets reduce bacterial growth in vitro and in vivo. When we look at these cells by electron microscopy, we can clearly see that lipid droplets marked with a green arrow were not randomly distributed, but they seem to locate in the proximity of the bacteria, pointed in red, in loaded macrophages. At higher magnification, we can observe in some cases that the surface of lipid droplet disrupts the vacuolar membrane that surrounds the bacteria and contacts the bacterial periplasm, suggesting that it might exist some mechanism of echemotaxis and docking. The question then was why and how mammalian lipid droplets proteins kill bacteria. Knowing that LPL increases the antibacterial capacity of lipid droplets, we purified hepatic lipid droplets from control and LPS treated mice, and we performed a comparative proteomic analysis of lipid droplet associated proteins by mass spectrometry. We identify more than 3,000 proteins, and from those, 317 were significantly upregulated in LPS lipid droplets and 372 were downregulated. Among the proteins that were downregulated in lipid droplets from LPS-treated mice, we found an important number of mitochondrial proteins, suggesting that during infection, the association of lipid droplets and mitochondria is reduced. The ingenuity pathway analysis that gives a functional analysis of the proteomic data told us that in fact, 70% of the proteins downregulated in the LPS lipid droplet fraction were mitochondrial components, supporting the idea that both organelles disconnect during infection. These reduced contacts were not due to a decrease in the mitochondrial content in response to LPS treatment, as shown by equal levels of citrate synthase activity, a validated biomarker for mitochondrial density, or cytochrome oxidase 1 levels that reflects the mitochondrial DNA content. 
the mitochondrial functionality was also preserved, as shown by high-resolution respirometry. Interestingly, the only protein known to be involved in lipid droplet mitochondria interaction, pyrilipin 5, PLIN5, was in the top 20 of the most down-regulated proteins of our list. This decrease of PLIN5 in lipid droplets after infection was corroborated by density gradient. We found that the presence of PLIN5 on the lipid droplet fraction, which is higher during fasting, was clearly reduced during infection. The same profile of cofractionation was found for a mitochondrial protein, ATP synthase, probably reflecting the uncoupling between the lipid droplets and mitochondria. To explore its role during infection, PLIN5 was transfected. Here we have a cell expressing PLIN5 located at the surface of the lipid droplet. This is the lipid droplet labeling and the mitochondria, marked by TOM20 antibody. At higher magnification, we can see how the presence of PLIN5 increases contacts between both organelles and in some cases mitochondria completely enwrapped a lipid droplet. Mitochondria and lipid droplet contacts were quantified by electron microscopy, showing an important decrease in the number of contacts upon LPS treatment. This uncoupling is not only due to PLIN5, and it seems that some other processes are also involved, as you can see in these images where membranes of the endoplasmic reticulum are placed in the middle of lipid droplets and mitochondria, preventing their contacts. All these events have important metabolic consequences. The lipid droplet mitochondria uncoupling results into a decrease on mitochondrial oxidative metabolism and lower levels of circulating ketone bodies in serum of infected mice, reflecting the metabolic switch that occurs during infection. So, which are the consequences of the uncoupling during infection? Well, we express uh, in human monocytic cell lines with presplin 5 and we infect them with E. coli. The presence of PLIN5 increases the contacts between lipid droplets and mitochondria, as we expect. But importantly, the number of interactions between lipid droplets and bacteria were reduced, and also the antimicrobial capacity with higher bacterial loads in infected cells expressing PLIN5 also in a different cell type. These results suggest that bacteria and mitochondria compete for the lipid droplet and their disconnection improves the antibacterial capacity of cells. So the analysis of the down-regulated protein tell us about the importance of lipid droplets in the metabolic switch in immunity. What about the up-regulated proteins in lipid droplets during infection? Among the 20 most upregulated proteins in lipid droplets, we found RAP18 and perilipin 2, and also two of the immunoreligated proteins already identified in lipid droplets, viperin and IGTP. We perform a gene interaction analysis of the upregulated proteins, and this analysis identified several functional clusters that contain highly correlated proteins like a cluster with proteins related with metabolism and nucleated around PLIN3, several clusters containing RAP GTPases, and a very large cluster that includes different histones. An interesting cluster was the one containing the most enriched proteins and nucleated around PLIN2, which also includes IGTP and Viperin. We validate the proteomic data by Western blot and we confirm that PLIN2, Viperin and IGTP were enriched in lipid droplets from LPS infection. When Viperin and IGTP were expressed in hepatic cells, here in green, they clearly accumulate in lipid droplets. This analysis also allow us to identify new immune-related proteins on lipid droplets, like this interferon inducible GTPases. When we express them in a human hepatic cell line, 
they clearly localize in lipid droplets, as shown in this immunocytochemistry with the overexpressed proteins in red and lipid droplets labeled in blue. Another important protein that we identified in the PLIN2 cluster was catholicidin, CAMP, an antimicrobial protein present in all organisms with a single form in humans and with a broad spectrum of antimicrobial activity. It is assumed that catholicidins are secreted and function extracellularly, so the presence of CAMP on lipid droplets has not been previously considered. We confirmed the presence of CAMP on lipid droplets by Western blood, and as you can see here, CAMP is really enriched in LPS lipid droplets. That CAMP was a lipid droplet resident protein was also demonstrated by sucrose density gradient when we express a human CAMP in hepatic cells, and also by immunofluorescence. So it seems that the signal, the hydrophobic domain of CAMP is probably functioning as a signal peptide for secretion of the protein, but also as a lipid droplet targeting motif. The question then was whether this intracellular CAMP on lipid droplets have antibacterial activity. With downregulate CAMP in macrophages by a small interfering RNA, and we see that cells with low levels of CAMP were clearly much more sensitive to E. coli infection, clearly suggesting a role of CAMP in the intracellular defense. To demonstrate the role of CAMP on lipid droplets, we designed a lipid droplet resident CAMP by replacing the signal peptide with the lipid droplet targeting motif, the hydrophobic domain of ALDI, a lipid droplet resident protein. This lipid droplet CAMP was mainly distributed on lipid droplet, as you can see in this density gradient, and by immunofluorescence. And importantly, cells expressing lipid droplet CAMP were more resistant to infection by E. coli, Listeria, and Staphylococcus, confirming that CAMP or lipid droplets participate in the immunodefense. In conclusion, we think that our study demonstrates that lipid droplets organize complex clusters of immunity-related proteins potentially involved in the intra- and extracellular defense system of infected cells. These clusters in lipid droplets provide infected cells with several biological benefits, an strategic location to attract pathogens, synergy between different immune systems operating simultaneously or coordinately against invaders, and safety for the rest of the cellular organelles by sequestering cytotoxic compounds. And to conclude, I would like to finish by showing you this short video, less than a minute, made by Rob Parton and the University of Queensland to illustrate what I've shown you today and how beautiful cell biology is. Thank you for your attention.